introduce Professor Francois Mack, who is actually my boss in Geneva, is the head of the cardiology service. And as you know, Francois is one of the major experts in Europe in uh, cardiovascular prevention and atherosclerosis. And he will talk about the DCBDME guidelines that uh, have actually not been launched yet. It's all yours, Francois. So good, good afternoon. Can I have my slides, please? By the way, uh, Philippe uh, Meyer, you did it well. Thank you for the introduction. I'm his boss. Let me, let me help Oh, you. yes, yes, please, yes. I know you're not my boss, but uh, I will certainly help you. We never know. We never know. Here we go. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be squeezed between uh, two heart failure talks, one from our brilliant uh, Swiss heart failure, or even European heart failure, uh, Frank, a friend from Zurich, and also uh, a mentor from heart failure. Thank you for coming from a long way. So I will have, uh, I, I heard that you have a lot of slides, so uh, I will squeeze my time and hopefully let you full for your presentation that we are waiting. So the title today is about the new dyslipidema uh, guidelines. Uh, these are my disclosure for this uh, talk, mainly about uh, pharma that are involved or were involved in uh, this lipidemia. As probably all of you know or should know, uh, age and lipids are the two principal cardiovascular risk factors leading to atherothrombosis and or coronary artery disease. Uh, with no offense, this is our small uh, AGLA, Swiss recommendation. And as you can see uh, here on uh, the left, uh, if you calculate, and you should calculate LDL, this will count for a lot of points. And the higher the points, the higher yourself or the patient will have a risk for future cardiovascular events. Now, the question, uh, and we don't know the answer, is what is the normal circulating level of LDL in our arteries? And probably the answer is zero. We don't need LDL in arteries. We just need LDL to be brought to other cells. Then it has to circulate. As you know, uh, man is the only species which can develop atherosclerosis without genetic defect, and we will spoke speak about genetic defect. So when I have been asked to speak about the new dyslipidemia guidelines, uh, they were supposed to come in May, three weeks ago, during the European Atherosclerosis uh, Society in East, um, Innsbruck, and they were not. They have been delayed a little bit, and this is the only slide that you will see about the new EAS, ESC 2016 guidelines. As I am in the committee of these guidelines, I have signed some confidential, so this is confidential. Nevertheless, uh, we are stick with the 2011 ESC guidelines, and uh, as you know, or should know, the magic number is 1.8 millimol, and for very, very, very high risk patient, we should reach the target of 1.8 millimol or 50%. The number 1.8, I can tell you, and this is not a secret, will not change. There will be some change, but not the number of 1.8. So to somehow entertain you for the next uh, 10 minutes, we can go through other recent European guidelines, the so-called prevention in clinical practice guidelines that have been published three weeks ago in the European Heart Journal. Mainly, there is a full chapter, of course, on lipids, and this is based on lots of trials from the last five, 10 years, or even more from the statin area or statin field. You probably be aware of the call cholesterol treatment trialist meta-analysis, 2005 in the Lancet, 2010, with more than 100 20, 170,000 patients that have been included either in primary and secondary prevention, and also more recently with 
familial hypercholesterolemia patient. And basically, as you know, one millimole decrease, whether you start one millimole decrease, you have a reduction of about 20, 20% relative risk reduction of future cardiovascular events. You have seen this kind of slide, better or bad of comparing to this one, secondary prevention, primary prevention, and even not mentioning here the recent HOPE 3 trial from Salim Yusuf and other colleagues, which also with a statin in a polypill showed a great reduction in a so-called middle class or uh, not so-called high class risk primary prevention patient. Thanks to uh, the IMPROVE-IT um, colleagues that published last year the IMPROVE-IT trial in the New England, as you may uh, remember, this is high risk patient just after the acute coronary syndrome. They are all on a statin. And on one group, they are placebo control or double blind to the ezetrol, simvastatin, easy 10 milligram. And even though it does not seem to be high difference, there is clearly a statistical difference due to a lower LDL combination of statin plus, whatever statin plus ezetrol, you lower LDL by 15, 20% lower, and you will have a relative risk reduction between 5, 6, 7 percent of future cardiovascular events, and this clearly will also somehow implement the wording of the future ESC lipid guidelines, no doubt. These are the lipid guidelines in the 2016 prevention from the European Society. The table here will be all, or the figure will be almost the same. So for very high risk patients, we need in the weeks to come, or after the uh, acute coronary events, we need 1.8 millimole as previously, and this is new, or a reduction of at least 50% if the baseline is between 1.8 and 3.5 as somehow an absurd example, if a patient come today, a young woman 50 at 1.9 LDL, you may be asked to reduce from 1.9 to 1, 50%. And this is probably based on the improved trial and also on the fact that we see more and more patients coming with LDL value that are, that are not so, so high. Same also for the class called high cardiovascular risk, 2.6, which is the same, but also or a reduction of at least 50% if the baseline is between 2.6 or 5.1. There is no change here for the remaining risky patient. The LDL should be around 3 or below 3 millimole per liter. There will always be, this is the one of the tables from the uh, prevention guidelines that have just been published, there will be also a table like this in the lipid guidelines coming probably for the ESC Rome meeting next August. As you'll see here, we have the very high risk patient that will need except, which will be quite rare, if they are already below 1.8, if this is not the case, they will need, of course, everywhere lifestyle advices and concomitant drug treatment. And you will see more than statin alone due to the fact that improve it clearly showed a benefit. And you will always, all also see the wording of the new protein called PCSK9. It's always easy to write, maybe not to write, but to, yeah, to write guidelines and to somehow promote the guidelines, it's not easy somehow to implement or to try to have our patient on target to follow the guidelines. And as an example here, I'll give you some data that Barry's Gensers and others from our SPUM special program, Université Medicine, ACS uh, program from Bern, Geneva, Lausanne, we collected from six years, prospectively, all acute coronary syndrome patients that were hospitalized in these four university hospitals. These are some data about around 1,500 patients. At a year, one year after the events, only 30% of these patients living in Switzerland reach the guidelines of 
1.8 millimole. So there is clearly a room to either increase the statin dose, probably yes, or end, add ezetrol, probably, certainly yes, and if not, if this is not enough, probably, and you will see this in the future ESC 2016 guidelines to add the new PCSK9 monoclonal inhibitors. Now, a brief uh, <coughs> story about the PCSK9 inhibitors. As there is a need for rooms to implement and to improve lipid lowering in our patient, thanks to familial hypercholesterolemia and other research in the field, that somehow uh, discovered this circulating protein called PCSK9. You have the acronym here down. Very uh, simply and briefly, if there is too much PCSK9, there will be lower expression of the LDL receptor and thus a high LDL circulating level. If by chance, by mutation, or by antibody treatment, or other one day, if you can lower PCSK9, you will have more LDL receptor expressed. If you have more LDL receptor expressed, you have low LDL circulating, and you are probably more at target values. So this is somehow a slide. They have other slides where you see now, finally, Frank talked about drugs. Finally, in practical field of cardiology, we are and we will be using more and more monoclonal human antibodies. These antibodies are directed to block, to catch P circulating PCSK9. Again, if the antibody block PCSK9, you will have more expression of the receptor. If you have more receptor, you have lower, lower LDL. This is a busy cartoon just about the three drugs, evolocumab, alirocumab, bocozicumab, from Amgen, Sanofi, and Pfizer. This is about 1,000, 100,000 patients include so far or will be included in prospective clinical trial, either against statin, either against statin and ezetrol, or ezetrol alone, women, men, old, young, and of course, a special topic is and will be familial hypercholesterolemia. We have a meta-analysis uh, last year published by Navereze and colleagues, uh, clearly showing these are all the trials. Some are very small trials, so we have to be cautious about that. But nevertheless, for LDL lowering, it's about 40 to 50% on top of statin, on top or on top of placebo. For HDL, and I don't think we know why and how, HDL is increased by five, seven, that's good news. It is statistically significant, even though we don't know. Neither we don't know why PCSK9 blocking antibodies lower LP little a. And thank you for this class, because we don't have today a drug to lower LP little a, which is clearly sometimes uh, uh, molecule, an LPL particle that increase the risk of atherothrombosis. Now, the, so, the good news also is that with these hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients, it doesn't seem to have any noise about side effects. No increase of creatine phosphokinase level, no muscle pain, no other serious uh, side effects. Of course, for this, we will have to need to follow other studies. Looking at the summary from phase three studies, it's a busy slide also, but look at the upper numbers, 75%, 88, 90. These are the numbers, the percentage of the patient, mainly familial hypercholesterolemia, men and women that will or could reach the target goal of LDL. Before PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, it was around 10, 15 mostly 40%. Now, we are close to 75 or higher percentage of the patient with familial hypercholesterol that will or are reaching target goal. Quickly, a fantastic story about the discovery, I think, in my knowledge, in Paris, 2003, they forget to patent the PCSK9 discovery at this time in INSERM Paris, and about 13 
or even no, 12 years ago, 12 years after the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies are, at least two of them, on the market in the US, in Europe, not fully reimbursed in some countries, probably because of a so-called too expensive price. Of course, regarding outcomes and major clinical cardiovascular events, we all are waiting for the so-called Fourier trial. This is an Amgen trial with Evolocumab. This is more than 27,000 patients with acute coronary syndrome. They are at very, very high risk. They are all on maximal statin-tolerated dose, whatever it means, and they have been double-blind placed on, ever, uh, on either Evolocumab, one or twice a month, or placebo injection, one or twice a month. We will see. What I can tell you is that this study should have last and a follow-up for four and a half or five years. And we all know that uh, they will reach the total number of events. This is an event-driven study. They will stop the study either this month or next month. And it is scheduled to be published probably early next year at the ACC meeting. We will have to wait <clears throat> for that. Now, what are today the indications to treat patients with monoclonal human antibody against PCSK9? Of course, very high-risk patients that are not on LDL target with a high dose of tolerated statin plus azetimibe, and probably, possibly, this is not the same in different guidelines, different country, patients with still statin intolerance. As you can see here, in both of these indications, there is FH, which means familial hypercholesterolemia. I will end this talk by few, very few slides on familial hypercholesterolemia, which clearly from our side, cardiologists, but also general practitioner, is a diagnose which is not as often as it should do diagnose in our persons or in our patients. This is a study from David Nunchen, again from uh, the SPUM consortium, patient from Zurich, Bern, Lausanne, Geneva. This is 4,000 patients that we follow. And if you look at the criteria, which are simple criteria to somehow diagnose familial hypercholesterolemia, mainly the Dutch lipid clinic criteria, for the total population, we are close to 15% of the patient who had an acute coronary syndrome may suffer or been diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. Here on the right, it's even worse. It's only 1,500 patients. These are premature, young patients, younger than 60 years old and with an MI. Then the possible diagnosis of familial hypercholesterol still on the Dutch lipid clinic criteria is close to 50%. One of two patients young, which will suffer from acute is probably diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. And if this interests you, it's a bit uh, commercial, but there will be tomorrow, I will present tomorrow some more data about the prognosis of, we have followed this patient after some years. We will even have the DNA of all these patients that we will present very soon. I will finish with two slides about, we all have learned and we know that the lower, the better. We should probably also add, it's not or, but add also the sooner the better. You have probably seen this kind of slide. You are familiar with the fact that an homozygous, hopefully rare family of rare patient, will get an MI after some years because of the mass of LDL circulating in the arteries. Heterozygote, the idea is to place this line as lower as possible to reach as, lower, as long as possible the cardiovascular events. I have uh, done this slide after a brilliant lecture from Nobel Prize um, um, Professor Brown in uh, Innsbruck two weeks ago about the so-called cumulative LDL and heart attack. So here you have the cumulative in gram per year. As for the tobacco and the cancer, United Packet de Euro, this is gram per year of LDL over the age. First scenario, a woman with 150 milligrams, she will get nine grams a year of LDL at the age of 60. This is mathematics. Now, if you have a, a man with familial hypercholesterolemia and 300 milligrams 
deciliter of LDL, he will get nine gram a year of LDL at the age of 30. This is, again, mathematics. And if you look now at a woman with a PCSK9 mutation and an LDL as low as 70, that happens, either by mutation or by the PCSK9. Then she will get the nine gram year of LDL at the age of more than 100. Nobody knows which is my or yours gram per year. This is the question. Now, in conclusion, dyslipidemia is clearly a major cardiovascular risk factor and contributes to atherothrombosis and subsequent acute coronary syndrome, lipid lowering with statins, and I think now, and etzetrol has shown to markedly reduce cardiovascular events, and importantly, familial hypercholesterolemia is still underdiagnosed here today in Switzerland and also undertreated. And there is a need to further reduce LDL cholesterol, especially in high-risk patients, for which the new guidelines still recommend 1.8, and from the prevention 2016 ESC guidelines also, or a reduction of at least 50% if the baseline is between 1.8 and 3.5 minimal. And monoclonal antibody against PCSK9 have been shown to markedly, no doubt, reduce LDL cholesterol with more patients on target, especially familial hypercolic patients, and with a very safe profile. And we hope, hopefully, this LDL lowering with monoclonal antibody will be soon translated in cardiovascular events reduction. Now, this is the best way to improve your lipid profile, as it is a French joke. It is cardiologic. And I will thank uh, two young investigators from our SPUM, Dr. Baris Genser from Geneva and also David Nonchen from Lausanne for the quick works I have shown to you today and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much.